Good evening. Did you bring your Bibles? Are you ready to study? What I want to do, I believe with all of my heart that our greatest need right now is Jesus Christ. Do you believe that? The Bible says he's Alpha, he's Omega, he's first and last, he's beginning and end. That there's no greater thing that we can do in this universe than have a friendship with Jesus. Now we're coming to the culmination of our little school here, the school on the loud cry, and we've been talking about this. We're not going to go so much deeper into that this, this evening. We're going somewhere else, but it's a part of it. Now this morning we were going into the Adventist home and we we're showing what a home should be like, the type of home we need. The Bible says that when a man comes face to face with death, that he should set his house in order. Am I right? We showed you that from scripture. We showed that that is the condition that we're in right now, that we need to have an experience with Jesus Christ. We went through what the man of God should be. Now I want to read this statement. Would you read this with me? Father, anoint your words as we have opened it, for we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Would you read that with me? What does it say? It says, words spoken in our homes, which are impatient and unkind, angels hear, and do you want to find in the books of heaven a record of the impatient and passionate words that you have uttered in your family? Impatience brings the enemy of God and man into your family and drives out the angels of God. Now, this, this is one of the most powerful quotations on this point. This is Heavenly Places 99. Let's read that together. If you are abiding where? Do you like that name? Yes. And Christ is in you, you cannot speak angry words. So if I start speaking angry, husband and wife, parents and children, what does it tell me has happened to Jesus? He's not in my heart. Fathers and mothers, I beseech you for Christ's sake be, to be kind, tender, and patient in your what? We found out that the greatest institution that God has given us is the home. And that what the church will be is what the home has made it. All the church is is just families that have been brought together under the inspiration and organization of God. Now, how did that get there? <laughs> Let's read that. What does it say? She's agreed to joint custody. How many night and weekend minutes do you want? This is what happens in many families. You know, when there's normally a separation, they have to have a mediation. How long? It's like the family has to talk to the cell phone with their children. How many minutes can I have with my child? Can you imagine the child, he spends, you know, this, 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 the studies suggest that a child spends, and an adult, between 8 to 10 hours on a device. Whether it be a phone or an iPad or a computer or whatever. Very little time uh, with family. Very little time with Jesus. How can you develop a relationship with Jesus and we don't spend time? Every relationship spends time. And that's why when we look at the end of time, it's significant because it takes time to become the friend of God. I want to be his friend. What do you say? Here's an accident. What did it say? They needed the jaws... Not to open the car door, not to open the car door. You know the jaws of life are, right? <laughs> they need the jaws of life to pry the cell phone from his hand. Do you know that this, the generation that we live in today is addicted, addicted Amen. to cell phones and devices? And it's amazing. You know that sociality is one of the natures of man. Man is physical, he's mental, he's spiritual, he's social. What's wrong with being social? Nothing. That's how God made us. God is a social being himself. That's why it's the Godhead. Let us make man. Let us do this. Godhead is social. So God has made us in his image social. So nothing wrong with that. But now listen. Do you know that this is a generation in which the devil takes everything good and perverts it, and then he uses the platform of that which is part of our nature? Do you know that the social platform is one of the greatest platforms that the devil uses today to get into the minds of youth and adults? Tell me some platforms that are social. Facebook. Now, I never understood why a man only has one face but three Facebook accounts. It didn't make sense to me. But, but Facebook, Instagram, well, give me some more. Give me some more. So these are there. Now, I want to ask you a question. A man will say he's social, but he know that this is the most antisocial generation. You can be in the elevator, and the man is on a social media. He's putting LOL. -L -L. What does LOL mean? And the man is getting ready to commit suicide. It's a lie. It's a deception. This is the most anti-social generation. You man walking down the store, you're in the store with the man, the man won't even look up at you. 
I mean, he's, he's putting money into the account. He won't even look at you when he passes the money on. He's too busy on the cell phone. Now, brothers and sisters, if this is where we're hooked, where's the time for Jesus? Where's the time for sweet Jesus? So God is not interested in condemnation. He's interested in educating us on how to spend our time. This is what most families look like. You say, oh, this is a lovely family. They're very close, aren't they? Now, if this is your home, just know that it's dysfunctional. But no, guess what? A dysfunctional home, if we accept Jesus, he can change it around. He can take a home like hell. We studied it this morning. We, sh we showed how homes become hell. But we also showed that by God's grace, it can become heaven. Now, here is a man. He's, he's over here. He looks like he's having a good time, smiling. She looks like she's a little bit distraught. She probably, hey, girl, what, what are you doing? What they tell you? you know? <laughs> he over there, he looks like trying to be a little more studious. He probably have, a, what's that one, Kindle? You probably have a little Kindle. And then a little boy, he playing, you can tell like a pear. I don't know if it's, they, they don't want to use Apple. But then they have all these various things. But the family is divided. Satan's plan is divide and conquer. He's taken the man out of the home. He has made the woman seem like she's not so valuable when our women are precious. Listen, if you're a woman in this room, you're precious. You're valuable. And our men should take care of our women. And look at what the generation is saying. Mommy, daddy, what? And you give them money. What is money going to do to take the place of you? We must give ourselves. This is what's happening in our homes. Husband must give himself to his wife. Wife must give himself to her husband. I am his and he is mine. Do you know that if that can happen in the home, do you know that if a, if a husband learned how to cherish and love his wife, then his wife would find it easier to reverence and respect her husband. But the man wants reverence and respect, but he doesn't love and cherish. And so the children grow up not seeing any of it. I think we need to set a house in order. What do you say? Now, I can't go along that study. We studied that more deeply this morning. But I wanted you to understand that God wants to bring us back as a family. I think he's trying to, give us, get ready, to get ready to give us the loud cry. What do you say? Now, my brothers and sisters, let's read this together. This is the book Evangelism, page 17. Is evangelism important, yes or no? Let's read it. What did it say? Evangelistic work. Now, in evangelistic work, shall we close the scriptures or open them up? It says, opening the scriptures, warning men, not just entertaining them, but warning men and women of, talk to me, what is coming upon the world? So is something coming to the world, yes or no? So then what should we be doing right now? We should be opening the scripture and being able to show men and women what is coming upon the earth, the world. It is to occupy more and still more of the time of God's servants. If we know what's coming, we should be talking. Guess what? We didn't start talking about 2020 in 2020. We've been telling you about 2020 for years. Am I right or wrong? Amen. Jesus said, I tell you before it come to pass, so that when it come to pass, you might what? Believe. Ah, uh, my brother, could you clear that for me? Thank you. You know who that man is right there? Who is he? I never even seen the movie before. I never saw it. <laughs> but those who have told me what that means. Oh, good to see you, my friend. Good to see you. But someone who saw I told me what that means, they, they, they told me that this man, what's his name? Morph, Morph, Morph what? Morpheus. Morpheus. That he had a red pill and a blue pill. And I understand that the blue pill, that's what you want when you want to stay asleep. When you want to be deaf, dumb, and blind, you take the blue pill. But if you want to wake up, you take the red pill. So I ask you tonight, which pill do you want? You sure? Are you sure? Now, if you want blue pill, then I would tell you to go home right now. I'll give you a little time. Nobody, hope, nobody hold it against you. I'll give you a little time to leave. Because this is, this is serious business. What I'm getting ready to show you is life and death. It's not, it's not a joke whatsoever. If you want the blue pill and you want to remain in a laxadaisical, careless situation, you can have the freedom to leave right now. 
Well, you didn't move, so I guess you want the red pill. Is that right? <laughs> the red pill says that when you get this pill, that your eyes got to come open. You want your eyes open? Yeah. Blue pill, remain in the blissful ignorance of illusion. Red pill embraces the sometimes, what's that next word? Painful truth. Now, sometimes truth can be stranger than fiction. Sometimes truth can be painful, but truth is truth, whether we like it or not. And it says, so embrace the sometimes painful truth, not of lies, but the painful truth of reality. You want the truth? Praise the Lord. Where do we got to go to get the truth? Sanctuary. Which part? Outer court, holy place, or most holy place? You know this is what Rose 7 Adventist Church up on? Inspiration said, it is too late in the day to do what? Feed with milk. If souls a month or two old in the truth, who are about to enter the time of trouble such as? Now does the Bible speak of that, yes or no? Where? We looked at it this morning. Where? Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. It says, the time of trouble such as never what it was cannot hear, not some, but all of the straight truth. Or undo the door of the strong meat of the straightness of the way. It asks the question. Let's read that together. How will they? Now that's the issue. God is trying to prepare people that can stand true to him when judgment passes from the dead to the living in the investigative judgment. That's at the Sunday law. 99% of our denomination has lost this. We have spiritual amnesia. We have lost our distinctive identity. And God is interested not in condemnation. He's interested in guess what? Education. When Jesus came to the world, the Jewish nation were blinded. But he said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. It says, truths that we have been what? Years learning must be learned in a... Now, my brothers and sisters, we don't have long. I believe that we're in the last few months to the last few years before this crisis breaks. And you said you want the bread pill. Is that what you told me? Yes. All right. The last act in the drama. 2020. It's no ordinary year. Now, I told you earlier that there was a person last week, not to bring everybody together and then we'll pick up. We're going to bring everybody together that wasn't here this morning. I told you last week that we were at church preaching at the uh, Fayetteville Seventh Adventist Church. And we put this up there and someone who was blessed or touched by God took a picture of it, put it on the internet to try to encourage everyone. Let's draw close to Jesus. And all of a sudden, somebody began to start commenting, what makes you think that 2020 is no ordinary year? How can you say that? Who is that pastor? Who is that minister? Who is that? Why, how could you say all that? Who, who? But my brothers and sisters, that was last week. I don't think anyone this week will ask if it's ordinary. And I told you this morning, we didn't start talking about this in 2020. We found that 2020 is the beginning of the... Now, I got to take you to two texts so we can all be together. What's the first text, those who are here? Whoa, 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 who's the, those who are here this morning, what's the first text we got to go to? Ezekiel. Let's go there. Let's go to Ezekiel 7. Remember, inspiration says evangelistic work, not closing the scriptures, but what? Oh, Opening the scriptures. Let's open the scriptures. And we need to show what is coming. Now, you should write this down because when you talk to somebody, you can make it plain. You don't have to make it up, not your denomination. Do you know, as a seven at Venice, you should be excited. Amen. Because listen to me. All seven-day Adventism is, is the religion of the Bible. Amen. If you believe the Bible, you will become a seven Adventist. I'm confident because I know what it says. It's a wonderful thing. When everything you believe is found in the word of God, you don't have to make up one word. Amen. That's what Jesus did. He lived by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. I want to follow Jesus. What do you say? Amen. So my brothers and sisters, in Ezekiel chapter 7, Jesus was very well acquainted with this. Ezekiel 7, we want to begin in verse 1. Are you there? Amen. Amen. What does it say in verse 1? Altogether it says, moreover, the word of the Lord. Is this the word of man or the word of God? And what did he say? Verse 2. Also thou, son of man, thus saith the Lord God unto the land of Israel. What's the next two words? And in. The end. Not is coming. It says the end is what? Come upon the four corners of the land. In other words, the, the end has come for the whole world. God showed this to Ezekiel in vision. In tight, 
That's when Nebuchadnezzar came down and took the children of Israel captive into Babylonian captivity for 70 years. If you go to chapter 8, you remember that that's when they turned their back on the sanctuary and then faced the east and worshiped the sun. That's where the son-in-law comes in in type. And in Ezekiel 9, that's where the sealing angel comes and seals us because the same thing must happen in the last days. When we come to the end, we will see the passing of a Sunday law. We will then have to be tested to receive the seal of God or the mark of the beast. And those who are faithful will receive the seal. They will receive the latter rain. They will give the loud cry. They will reach the other sheep that are not of this fold because the majority of God's children are not in the Seventh Adventist Church. The majority of God's people are in the Catholic Church, the Baptist Church, the Pentecostal churches, and most of the devils are in our church. And God has to shake it up because he wants to move out everyone that's not like Jesus. He wished we could all stay. He wished all of us could stay, but he doesn't force us. He loves us. And so he's a God of choice. And so he says, choose you this day whom you will serve. So Ezekiel is the Bible in type. All these things were written for our samples upon whom the ends of the world are come. Now the Bible says, in this come, verse 3. Let's read verse 3. What does it say in verse 3? Now is the... Now, wait a minute. I just, I thought you said the end has come twice in verse 2. Why are you repeating it again? Talk to me. It's urgent. Then it goes on. Go down to verse 6. What does it say in verse 6? And in is come the end. And then I asked you earlier this morning, what do you think Ezekiel was trying to tell to Israel? What do you think he was trying to tell them? Amen. That we're down at the end. Now, are there certain events that God said we would see in a nation when the nation reaches its end? Yes or no? Verse 15. Look at verse 15. Notice what it says in verse 15. I want you to tell me you're going to see three things in verse 15. There's normally four, but three are always there. Let's read verse 15. What does it say in verse 15 altogether? It says, the sword is without and the pestilence and the famine within. So tell me the three things. Talk to me. What's the first? Sword. sword. What else? Famine. What else? Pestilence. If you were to study through the Bible, you would find that God would allow this to come to nation after nation when a nation is getting ready to collapse, when it comes to its limit. Verse 15 says, the sword is without and the pestilence and famine within. He that is in the field shall die with the sword, and he that is in the city by what? Talk to me. Famine and pestilence shall devour him. Now, question, was that a sign of the end, yes or no? Yes. Now, when Jesus came on the scene, did Jesus point to these same signs as the signs of the end, yes or no? How do we know? Let's go to Matthew 24. Let's go there. This is the second text we want to put together, and then we all be together. Go to Matthew chapter 24, and Jesus was talking. Now, you may not believe a minister, but you should believe Jesus. Amen? Amen. Look at the words of Jesus. Matthew chapter 24, and we want to notice what the Bible says in verse 3. The Bible says in verse 3, let's read that together. Are you there? Amen? Amen. What does it say in verse 3? It says, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him how? Privately saying, tell us, what's the next word? Now, what does when suggest? Location or time? So it says, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the, what's the next word? Question. What were they concerned about when they asked him that question? What were they concerned about? They were concerned about the end of the world. Has the end of the world fully come about yet? Is the world over or are we still in the world? So they're interested in the end. They're wondering about the end of the world. And then Jesus gives them signs. Look at verse 6. Let's see where some of the signs about the end are. Verse 6, what does it say? And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Now question, did Ezekiel talk about those same things, yes or no? Where? That's what the sword represents. This is the war. So one of the first things it says, we should understand this war. Then it says, wars and rumors of war, see that you be not trouble, for all these things must come to pass, but the, what everybody? So what was Jesus trying to help them understand? Not the beginning so far, but just the, the what? End. Then the Bible says, he names some other things. In verse 7. It says, for nation shall rise against what? Nation. All right, so then that's something else. Or is that war? Is that talking about war and sword? Yes or no? Yes. Same thing. It says, nation shall rise against nation. What else? Kingdom, kingdom against kingdom. What else? And there shall be famine. famine. Same thing. What else? 
Pestilence is the same thing in earthquakes in diverse places. That's environmental devastation. So this fourth thing that it brings out is that there is to be environmental uh, devastation. Give me another name for environmental devastation. Has the climate changed, yes or no? Now at first, Trump said it was a hoax until his Mars logo uh, 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 residence is almost under the water. He has two resorts in other parts of the world, almost under the water. He says, now there, uh, there's not a hoax anymore. I have the paper. He says, no longer a hoax. He says, it's real. Yes, he did. Now, my brother and sisters, 2020 is no ordinary year. We're coming back to that. This CIA report says that CIA report predicts that American global dominance could end in what? 15 years. Now, when was this written? What does that say? 2005. 2005, I asked you this morning, plus 15 equals what? So then, way back, we are understood, way back then, I've been collecting this. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, that 2020 is no ordinary year. God has looked down in the annals of time and showed us before it ever took place. Look at 2020. The beginning of the end. Someone says, well, it looked ordinary to me. Remember I showed you? What happened to NBA season? You see what happened in other countries? It's not just stunning. Stunning isn't the right word. I mean, it's crazy. What's he saying? It's not ordinary. Now, my brothers and my sisters, when in the history of America has NBA season shut down, suspended? When? Never. I showed you in 1998-99, the season uh, was delayed a couple of days. 50, delayed a couple of days, but never suspended. In fact, he says, suspending a season, this is NBA.com, suspending a season in progress with five weeks remaining to the 82-game schedule and playoffs set to begin in April 18 is entirely, what's that next word? In other words, this is no ordinary thing. What happened to NCAA? What happened to March Madness? What happened to Disney World? What happened to Universal Studios? What happened to the schools? What happened to the universities? What's happening to the world? My brothers and sisters, this has never happened before. Coronavirus spread over. So now, if it's never happened before, and then you see it happening in 2020, how can you contest if this is an ordinary year? Why, the man last week says you can't prove it's ordinary, and this week you shouldn't even open up your mouth. Where is that? Yes, this is not ordinary. What's that? Yeah, this is not ordinary. Again and again, the Lord has instructed our people to take their, what, families away from the cities into the, where they can raise their own, someone, oh, are you crazy, uh, going out of the city into the country? Yes, they said, no, it was crazy too, and until it started raining. He looked intelligent then. Can you imagine how many people that laughed at Noah when he went out to the country and had his little ark? But when the crisis broke, they wished they had a little place on board that ark. They wished they could find Pulaski. For in the future, the problem of what? Buying, Buying and selling will be a very serious... Now, you can't wonder if this is a prophet. The prophet over 100 years ago saw it. And everything that prophet says and the spirit of prophecy is in the Bible. Everything that prophet says, the Bible says. Do you believe that? Well, then you're almost a seven-day Adventist. It says it will not be a serious one. It will be a what? You think mind and selling is very serious? Yes or no? Blessed is that man that when he goes out of his house, the water that he drinks belongs to him. It's a wonderful thing when you can leave out of your house and drink water that comes from your spring and from your will, and from your sister. It's a wonderful thing when you can walk outside and not fear if a store closes. To know that God has already provided what you needed. Someone says, well, I don't have to do nothing. All I have to do is pray for God to take care of me, and God's going to take care of me. There's a difference between faith and presumption. Could Noah had been held in the palm of God's hand, yes or no? God could have held him in the palm of his hand during the flood. But what did Noah do? He built an ark. Why did he build an ark? Because that's what God's word said. And faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So if God gives us instruction in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, and we don't follow it, that's not faith, that's presumption. Who told us to get out of the city? God did. Who told us to raise our own provision? God did. And so that's not uh, presumption, that's faith to do what he says. 
Now, if someone were to come to know and say, don't worry, no, righteousness is my faith. God will take care of you inside and say, don't build an ark. Just, just know that God's going to keep you. You know what would happen when the flood came? They would say, God will... <laughs> they would have drowned. We need to do what God says. He means what he says. What do you say? It says, we should now begin to heed the instruction given us over and over again. Get out of the cities into rural districts where the houses are not crowded. What? If you look out your window into the house of another man, you're too close. Amen. If you can put your hand outside and slap five with the other, you're too close. Amen. It says, you got to be free from the interference of the enemies. Anticipating a potential quarantine. Shoppers ran out this weekend to the what? In the future, the problem of buying and selling will be a very... People couldn't even buy what they wanted. They could have had a, a wad full of money, but no tissue in the store. A wad full of money, but no, you know, that right now on the stores, they were selling the little mask, the N, uh, what was it, N95 mask for $2,000 and $5,000. Exposing themselves and their families, others alarmed by the rising death count and number of confirmed cases went on impulse of buying binges. Online stores were hit hard. Amazon, all of it wiped out. But if we do what God says, we'll be all right. What's that first word? Educated. Notice that it does not say condemn. We're not to condemn our people. We're supposed to be family. We're supposed to be helping each other. In the crisis, you don't attack each other. In the crisis, you're supposed to be pressing every seven Adventists worldwide. I don't care what church he belongs to. If you're a seven Adventist, we should be pressing together. But not pressing together in error, pressing together in truth that's found in the words of Jesus Christ. Now, my brothers and sisters, it says, educate, not condemn. We're not into condemnation, but what? My people are destroyed for a lack of? Educate our people to get out of the cities, into the country, where they can obtain a small piece of what? Why do we want some land? Because that's something that God wants us to do on that land. Where we can make a what? We were talking about how to get our homes ready. Do you think that God wants us to have a happy home, yes or no? for themselves and their children but ere long in a little while there will be such what strife and confusion where in the cities that those who wish to leave them will what now if there's a quarantine can you leave the city you may wish to but you can't go anywhere that's why we're getting about here tomorrow amen <laughs> we love you but we got to go our home is in Virginia. We live out in the country in the mountains, out in the hills out there. But the inspiration says that the people of God should visit the cities like Enoch did and warn them of what's coming upon the earth. So we're here giving a warning message. What do you say? Amen. But we're all family. We're trying to get ready. Now, my brothers and sisters says, but early long, there'll be such strife and confusion in the cities that those who wish to leave them will not be able. We must be what? Preparing for these issues. This is the light that God has given me. Now, brothers and sisters, our whole way of life has become disrupted. Inspiration says that Satan will bring, this is great controversy, 589. Satan will bring disease and disaster until populous cities are reduced to ruin and what else? Desolation. Even now, he, Satan, is at work in accidents and calamities by what? Sea and by land. What else? In great what? What's the conflagration? What's that? Have we seen them in California? Yes or no? Have we seen them in Australia? Yes or no? Unprecedented. It says, in fearest what? What just ripped through, through uh, Nashville? What did it? In terrific hailstorms and tempests and floods and cyclones and tidal waves and earthquakes and every place and in a thousand forms, who's doing this? Satan is exercising what? His power. What about them now? Watch what it says. He sweeps away the ripening harvest and famine. Sign. Famine and distress follow. He imparts to the what? Air. Air a deadly taint. And thousands do what? Perish by the, by the what? Everything that prophet says, the Bible says, Jesus told us this was a sign of the end. Now, my brothers and sisters, my question is, what is a pestilence? A disease. Now, my brothers and sisters, when you read Matthew 24, it says, what should be the sign of thy coming and the end of the? So then, what type of pestilence would it have to be? A world pestilence. Now, is there a difference between an epidemic and a pandemic? Yes. What's an epidemic? Remember the words? Epi means what? Above, like epidermis on the, the top layer of the skin. The, the, the demic means what? P. 
people, like a democracy, the people. So an epidemic is, the, uh, uh, is when the disease is upon the people in one locality. But pandemic, what does pan mean? All. The word means all. Endemic people. So when the disease moves from just being in one local area to become all global worldwide, then you have a pandemic. And Jesus in Matthew 24 was warning not so much about an epidemic, but about a what? Pandemic. Is it here? Yes or no? Jesus said, what did Jesus say about this? Go to Matthew 24, verse 32. What did he say in verse 32? In verse 32, it says, now learn a Matthew 24, same chapter. Verse 32, it says, now learn the parable of the what, everybody? Fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and put it forth leaves, you guess or you know? No. You know the summer is not. There are signs. When you look at the trees, they can tell you the season or the time. Verse 33 says, so and likewise, when you shall see all these things, don't guess but what? Know that it is near. How near? Amen. So verse 33 says, so likewise, when you shall, is it invisible or visible? When you shall what? See. It says, when you see these things, don't guess. It says, when you see these things, what? Don't ask pastor or elder or father or mother or yourself. When you see it, know that it is near. How near? Even at the, how near is that? Verse 34, verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. So when we see this, we were to know that when we saw it, no question, this generation shall not pass. Question, what generation is that? Limit generation? Is it the last generation? Is it the first generation or the final generation? So the Bible is saying that we can understand by the signs the final generation based on events. And when we see the events, the date are attached to events. Now, my brothers and sisters, this is what God told us. Now, what will be the next step? Because do we see this pestilence, yes or no? Yes. Is it a pandemic, yes or no? Yes. Now, someone says, well, wasn't there a pandemic in 1918? Yes, it was. But guess what? Was there a famine, a worldwide famine in 1918? No, sir. But do you know that there's a worldwide famine today? United Nations, go check it. 80% of the world, no food today. United Nations have an article out. You can go to their page. You can look it up. See, when you have truth, you don't have to fight. When you have truth, all you got to do is open the truth up. The truth, you go back to United Nations, there's something called the 2030 Agenda. They, they put it back in 2015. They were trying to show that the world is unsustainable right now. Its resource is gone. And Jesus said there will be a famine of bread and water. Not only that, but it's going to go on from natural to spiritual. But my brothers and sisters, all that means is that there's going to be a famine of natural what? Resources. Do you know that right now that was not so in 1918? They hadn't even jumped into the oil yet. But do you know right now we're at peak oil? Every resource we have, we're reaching the limits of it. Now, my brothers and my sisters, what's the next step after this according to the, the word of God? Watch now. It says, these visitations are to become more and more frequent, and what else? So if you think that corona goes away, guess what's going to come in just a little while? Another one. It says, become more and more frequent and disastrous. Destruction will be upon both man and... Now, what's the very next step? Because we're right here. It says, then the great deceiver will persuade men that those who serve God are causing what? The class who have provoked the pleasure of heaven will charge all their troubles upon those who are obedience to God's commandments is a perpetual reproof to transgressor. It will be declared that what? Men. men are offending God by the violation of the Sunday Sabbath, that this sin has brought calamities that will not cease until Sunday observance shall be what, everybody? Strictly enforced. So that means that when we saw the famines and the pestilence and all that, that is just before the passing of a Sunday law. Remember Ezekiel 7? Famine, pestilence, sword, war, then Sunday law, then sealing. It's the same thing in Matthew 24. Type meets any type. Now, my brothers and sisters, this brings us down to where we are today. Is the Sunday law getting ready to be passed? Yes or no? The Protestant world has set up an idol Sabbath in the place where God's Sabbath should be, and they are treading in the footsteps of the... That's the image of the beast. For this reason, this is one of the reasons, I see the option... I see the necessity of the people of God doing what? Now, if you're not God's person, you can do what you want, but the people of God. I see the necessity of the people of God moving out of the cities into retired country places where they can do what? Number one, cultivate the land and raise their own what? Thus, they may bring their what? Children up with simple, helpful habits. I see the necessity of slowing down. Making haste to get all things ready for what? Everything. Now, everything means physical and spiritual not just a physical preparation not just a spiritual preparation 
We need both a physical and spiritual preparation. Just like Noah did, we must have. Now, once you understand this, you begin to start seeing that coming events are like what? Go back to Matthew 24, first part. Jesus said, when you see this, know what's coming. These are the signs of the end. And then notice what Jesus said, verse 7 again. It says, for nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be what, everybody? Famines and pestilences and earthquakes. Where? All these are the... Now, wait, wait a minute. Now, he was talking about the end, but now he says, these are what? These are the beginning. So the beginning of sorrows is really the beginning of what? Of the end. So when we see those events, what we're noticing is the beginning of the end. And question, did they happen in 2020? Yes or no? This is no ordinary year. Upon the authority of the word of God. And when I tell you, I'm not asking. When Noah said that it was just a, 120 years, he wasn't guessing. He was making a declaration. So my brothers and sisters, what do you do with a puzzle? How do you put a puzzle together? You take all the pieces and do what? What do you do with the puzzle? Dump them out. Even if you don't know where the pieces go, you dump them out. Then you begin to start doing what? Grouping those pieces. The ones that look alike. Then after you start grouping the pieces that look alike, if you really know how to put a puzzle together, I'm going to test you to see if you know how to play a puzzle. <laughs> How do you put a puzzle together? You really know how to put it together. What do you do next? After you got everything on the piece and you, you group them just like they had them grouped a little bit, what's the next thing you do? What's the next thing you do? You look at the picture. Now, if you, if you didn't tell me look at the picture, I know you didn't play puzzles good. <laughs> you got to look at the picture. You don't know what you're putting together. Now, do you know that the Bible is a jigsaw puzzle? How many pieces? The words of God. Jesus said live by every word. 783,137 words in the Bible. How many verses? 31,102 verses. Text. And it's amazing. Uh, the devil will send us a text. Man will send us a text. We answer it. God gave us over 31,000 texts. We don't even answer one of them. Something's wrong. But my brothers and sisters, these are the pieces of the puzzle, but we've got to have the picture that the Bible is built, built on from Genesis to Revelation. And in the class this week, we showed you, and I can't prove it today, but I'm telling you, the class that was here, you know it from the Bible now. What's the picture? What's the picture? Talk to me, class. Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. It shows us the work of Jesus from the beginning to the end. And when you watch that picture, you can put the entire Bible together from Genesis to Revelation. And then once you understand the picture, what's the very next thing you do? The then you start putting the what? The edges, the borders. Give me another name for borders. Limits. Now, when you study the sanctuary, you will find out that you know the limit of Genesis to Revelation, the limit of the world's history. What is the borders? Those over here, and I can't prove it all in detail now, but it's plain from the Bible. What's the limit? Talk to me. 7,000 years. God finishes everything in what? Seven. Now, see, you, you think that you're just a seven Adventist for some reason. I'm going to tell you something. Seven Adventists, you're going to find out that everything we believe is based on Bible. The whole Bible is built on the number seven. From Genesis, it starts with the first seven days of the week. You won't find out from the very beginning to end, Revelation. How many churches in Revelation? Seven. How many seals? Seven. How many plagues? Seven. How many heads the beast have? How many uh, 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 seals? Seven. seven, seven, seven. Always seven. So my brothers and sisters, you want to find out that God has allotted 7,000 years to the history of redemption, and the devil knows this. He knows that he has but a short Revelation 12, 12. Now, my brothers and sisters, do you know when you start putting the puzzle together, when you get closer to the end, you recognize where the pieces go. Am I right? And until you get to that final piece, when you get to the, the final piece, even a child can come along and put the piece right where it belongs. Now, my brother and sister, when you understand that, you know the final piece is NSL. What's NSL? National Sunday Law. That's the mark of the beast. That's what's happening. What comes just before? 2020 is the beginning of that. We know it because of the events. Amen. The events tie us into the date. Not the date. We don't just sit down counting numbers up, but we know the events. And the events take us to the date. Jesus said, that there will be a great work that must happen in a little time. We saw the time. Now, I'm going to show you. Do you know that every Seventh-day Adventist used to teach what I'm teaching you right now? Every pioneer. You know, what is the school that most ministers go to today if they're going to be a, seven, uh, they're going to be a minister? What's the school? Se what, the cemetery? <laughs> what, what, what is it? What's the school called? What's the school? Andrews. Why is it called Andrews? Because there was a pioneer, a Seventh-day Adventist pioneer, who was named J.N. Andrews. Now, here is Jane Andrews. So now, if you would go, if a minister would go to his school to be trained, at least he should believe what he taught. Right? And if he doesn't, then maybe take his name off the school. But if you do, believe what he taught. Now, here, here's the man. Here's the man. We're going to show you J.N. Andrews. That's where the name is came after. Let me see if I can blow it up just a little bit and we can read it. Now, let's see what he says. 
uh, it says, jumping now here, it says, in the sixth article, Jan Andrews stated the same concept. Now, in the sixth article, he had been doing this article for several years. It's 1883, Sister White's alive. She's reading the articles, and he's been doing it for six straight weeks. He did something called the Great Week of Time for six straight articles. Look what he says. After seven of these weeks of years came the year of Jubilee. In this year, liberty was proclaimed throughout all the land to all the inhabitants, and every man returned to his own inheritance. This signifies that after the great Sabbath, during which the earth will remain uncultivated for a thousand years. Does the Bible speak of a thousand years, yes or no? Yes. Where? Revelation 20, a thousand years we will be in heaven with God. It says, the great week of what? Seven thousand years being finished? The curse will cease after having consumed the earth with all the wicked. Then the earth will be created anew by the power of God, and all the just will return to their inheritance in the new earth and never know sin nor sorrow anymore. This is what every seven heavens used to teach. We used to even have it in our song books. How many remember that old seven heaven is him, holy day, Jehovah's rest? You ever heard that before? How does the first stanza go? First is six days work was done. Then the Sabbath was begun. Thus he blessed the seventh day. Thus in resting we obey. Then he goes on. And guess what he says? He says, thousands have his plans reversed. Resting now upon the first. Search the book and you shall know. There's no scripture. Tell them so. All who speak the truth must say. It was man who changed the day. In God's word, no change appears through the whole 6,000 years. We used to teach it. This is the hymn. All who speak the truth must say it was the Pope. That's what they originally said. <laughs> they weren't afraid back then. Now today you're afraid, but they weren't afraid back then. All who speak the truth must say it was the Pope who changed the day. In God's word, no change appears through the whole what? So that means the final generation, the limit generation, the last generation is the generation on earth that reaches the 6,000 years. 6,000 on earth, 1,000 in heaven. What do we have? 7,000. That's the history of redemption. Now, my brothers and sisters, the reason why we don't know this today, it sounds strange, is because we have spiritual amnesia. We've lost our identity. We lost our history. We lost our heritage. And what we need is not condemnation, but what? Education. You know, you want to enslave a man, just destroy his history. Destroy his origin. Destroy where he came from, and you can make that man a slave. Now, my brothers and sisters, this is why. Now, look what this says. This is now not Bible. This is now not spirit of prophecy or pioneers. This is newspaper. What does it say? 2030, what? This is the end. What did Ezekiel say? And what? End is come. Will it really be the end like the doors were telling us back in the 70s? Or will it not? Now, my brothers and sisters, today it says we have enough. What's that next word? Data. What does that mean? Information. Knowledge, facts. We saw how it says, we saw how it says, 2030, in a world, it says today we have enough data in a world where most of us do not have time to what? Why don't we know about this? Because we're not what? Reading. Explaining that 2030 is the year of a major shift in our what? That if you study science, history, anthropology, I don't care what field of knowledge. You can study any of them. Anybody who knows, they will tell you that this is a year of planetary shift. Not just for one thing. Not just the economy, but everything with it. In other words, this is what they're saying. For the past 42 years, this is way back in 1972. I have the report, I have the, uh, the contents, and they're right on. It says, they, these scientists wrote a book called uh, uh, Limits to Growth, explaining that 2030 was the expected year for a planetary system, what? In their book and study called the... Limits to growth. They're looking at resources, all these various things, and recognizing this. It says, not another dot-com bubble or financial crisis. Not just money. It's talking about the everything we call life. It says, no, a system collapse. Not enough what? Food to feed us. What do we call that? Famine. It says, not enough food to feed us all due to depleted soil. No more fish to catch because of ocean acidification, overfishing activities. Not enough drinkable water. This is resources for all due to pollution, climate change. This is what Jesus talked about. And overpopulation. No more raw materials, resources to keep the pace of our throughput-based industrial system. And on and on and on and on. In other words, there's a limit to growth. When we come to the limit, we're not in the first generation. But when you see these things, know that this generation shall not pass until all these things be fulfilled. It says... This computer explained when it went through all the details. We cannot go on beyond the earth's what? Carrying capacity without headed towards a... That's why the United Nations got the world together in 2015 and wrote a document called 2030 Agenda for Sustainability. 
You go back and check it out. They've been right on, brothers and sisters, dead on. But guess what's happening? Yet we are still in a what? Business as usual mode, still waiting for governments to act. Well, guess what? They're getting ready to act right now, but not the way we want them to act. I'm not sure. You, you want some more? You want some more? Yes. Red pill or blue pill? Red. All right, let's stop and pray. Let's stop and pray and say, Lord, help us. We need Jesus. Oh, come, let us kneel and let's bow down before the Lord, our maker. Heavenly Father, we're in a crisis. You've given us the Bible. You've given us Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the angels, all of heaven is interested in our salvation. You don't want us to be lost. Please help us to sense the time and to wake up and clean up and stand up before it is too late. Show us what we need in these few minutes that we study together. Lord, we can't go through everything, but we're going to look at just a few of the high points to show us, Lord, if ever there was a time to get ready, it's now. Bless us, we pray. I can't do it, Lord. I'm weak, I'm ignorant, I'm feeble. I need you to give wisdom in your Holy Spirit. Help us so that we can run to Jesus and set our house in order before it is too late. For nothing else will matter but this. For what should it be to gain the whole world and then to lose our own soul? Lord, we want Jesus. Please help us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's go forward. I believe you begin to see that the world, they talk about this 2030 collapse. But guess what they say? They say the model's calculations take into account trends in pollution levels population growth, the amounts of natural resources. They're using hard data. And the overall quality of life on Earth, the models, predictions for the worsening quality of life, and the dwindling natural resources has so far been what? Unnervingly on target since 1972. It says, in fact, what's that word right there? Well, you don't have to worry about that because that's a long way away. Is that right? It says 2020 is the first milestone envisioned by World War I. Uh, this is that computer. That's when the quality of life is supposed to drop dramatically. This scenario that will lead to the demise of large numbers of people. At around 2020, the condition of the planet becomes highly what? Critical. And if we do nothing about it, the quality of life goes down to zero. Pollution becomes so serious, or seriously, it will start to what? I wonder if it's happening one time. I wonder. My brothers and my sisters, inspiration tells us that this is the case. This says, the looming what? This is the, 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 the Permaculture Research Institute. They're not seven Adventists. They're not necessarily Christians. These are just dealing with food itself. And guess what they say? The looming food crisis and the food, what? 2030 report. India will soon run out of what? Water. Extremely high crisis level. Some of the biggest nations. The world needs a what? Water. It says during the, the face-off, our government has decided to stop our share of water. Prepare for the next conflict, what? Water wars. Global, what, what do you call global? Like a pandemic, it's world. Global war, war, water war threat by what? I don't care what field you turn into in society. It's the same thing. Everything says the same. My brothers and sisters, climate change, environment, same things Jesus told us to look at. Who told us to look at these things anyway? Jesus. Jesus. Planet has only until what? To stem a, a catastrophic climate change, experts warn. And they have data to this. I can't go through the details. It says, and if we do not change course by what? We risk missing the point where we can avoid runaway climate. It doesn't matter where you go. It's the same place. Over and over again, the same thing. We're at the beginning of the what? Talk to me. Who told us to look for these things? Jesus. He said we should look for political conflict, war, famines, lack of water, resources, earthquakes, environment devastation, change. What else? What pestilence is has now shook up the world? What pestilence? Talk to me. Coronavirus. It shook up the world. Coronavirus. Now the historian says, the historian writes that all negative trends that are plaguing America now are likely to get much worse, growing rapidly by what? And will reach a critical mass no later than what? Every field of knowledge. I, I could take the rest of the night showing you this, but we're not doing that. My brother says, I think we need to, I think we need to do three things when, because this son-in-law is getting ready to pass. I think number one, we need to what? And then what? Clean up and then what? Stand up so we can be ready to meet Jesus in peace. What do you say? I can't go through this physical ministry. spiritual. This is what God wants to do. The seven practical principles of preparation. Here's Corona becoming a global epidemic. Now question, what is the official name for coronavirus? What's the official name? 
COVID, don't forget this, 19. Why 19, though? Because they first discovered it in 2019. Is that co is because of the, the name of the, the normal uh, uh, coronavirus. This is what it's dealing with in this vid. Now, I want to ask you a question. When did they find the coronavirus? Uh, 2019, right? So why wasn't 2019 the beginning of the end? No. Because remember now, it was not a pandemic world in 2019. When did it become a, when did it become a pandemic? WHO, 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 not who, but who, World Health Organization. They told us in 2020, they declared officially, when Jesus said, when you see it, this generation shall not pass. This is the generation. All of it together, all within that same time frame, it said 2020 to what? And I told you, what? Plus or minus. What does that mean? Maybe a little before, maybe a little bit after. Now, question. All who speak the truth must say. Remember that? Through the whole six when Jesus came on the earth, you know, about, about 4,000 years of human history passed, right? When Jesus died on the cross, about 4,000 years. What year did Jesus die? What year did he die? 31 AD. How many years was left until his return? If you had four and you take away from 6,000, what would you have? 2,000. Is that close to 2030? Yes or no? God has not given us the exact day and hour, but he told us that the generation that we would see events to let us know that we're in that 6,000 generation, we are in it. Wouldn't it be interesting to find out if the 6,000 years were to terminate somewhere around here, plus or minus. Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Now, it says, a it goes on. Coronavirus comes on the scene. Now, I want you to look at something. We'll come back to this. We'll come back to this another time. This is the official document where they named it, and they even tell us when, the name, uh, when it was actually given to us. When they named it. We'll come back to that. As a people, we are called individually to be students of what? My teacher, Elder Mason, used to love this one. We must watch earnestly, we must watch earnestly with all earnestness that we may discern any ray of light, any ray of light which God shall present to us. We are to catch the what? First gleam of the truth, and through prayerful study, clear light might be obtained, which can be brought forth. When, I, when God first showed me this, I was studying and I said, Lord, I never saw it. But then I studied on it, prayed with it. And clear light was in. Now we can bring it before others. Now, let's go there. We'll come to it in just a moment. You're going to see this in the ordinary year. We're at the beginning of the end. We see that what we need is a, there is a relationship between what? There's a relationship. Don't forget that. You want to write that down. That's very important. There's a relationship between events and date. Let me show you this. This is in the Great Controversy. Let me give you an example. In Great Controversy 227. Now, the Bible says it this way. In Ecclesiastes 1.9, as it hath been, so shall it be. There's nothing what? New under the sun. Now watch, this is Great Controversy 227. It says, France, by a solemn and public ceremony, was to commit herself fully to the destruction of what? Protestantism. The priests, the kings, all came together to destroy Protestantism. What year did they do it? Can you tell me what year? What year did they make that decision? Talk to me. It's right there. What year? The, is, is, is January what? 15, what else? 15, what? All right. That's when the priests and the kings rejected the gospel that came to France. It was the gospel to France. Now watch now. It says the 21st of January 1535 was fixed upon the awful ceremony. The superstitious fears, bigoted hatred in the whole nation had been roused. Paris was thronged with the multitudes that from all the surrounding countries crowded the streets. The day was to be ushered in by a vast and imposing procession. There was a vast procession. Kings was there. Priest was there. They went through a particular area. The, the four orders of the friars followed, each on his own peculiar dress. It was a vast assembly. That's the point. Great Controversy 2.30. It says, the gospel of peace, which France had what? When did they reject it? January what? January 21st, what? 15 what? They rejected the gospel where? In what? France. It says, the gospel of peace which France had rejected was to be too surely rooted out and terrible would be results on the 21st of January when? So you'll find out that the France rejected the gospel here. With priests and kings. But then you'll find out that guess what? As a result of rejecting the gospel, the French Revolution took place. Guess when it started? Talk to me. January what? 21st. The what? 
17 what? Now, did you see this? Watch now. The same date that they rejected the gospel is the same date that it started over 200 years later, the revolution. There's a connection between events and what? Dates. Are we together thus far? Are we together? The Bible says, as it hath been, so shall it be. There's nothing new under the sun. History repeats itself. Watch. 258 years from the very what? Day. That fully committed France to the persecution of the reformers, another procession with a far different purpose passed through the streets of Paris. Same procession, same streets, same day. Again, who's there again? The Who was there 200 years before? The king. Again, the king was the chief figure. Again, there were tumults and shouting. Again, was heard the cry for more victims. Again, there was backsliding. In other words, history is being repeated. Again, the scenes of the day were closed by struggling hand to hand with his jealous and executioners and his head rolled in the French Revolution. Dates often repeat themselves in prophecy. Did you hear what I said? All right, watch it now. A statement rocks Rome. Then send shock waves where? Where? Around the world. Does anybody know who that man is? Who is that? That's not, that's not Francis. That's Benedict. Benedict 16. Anybody know what statement he made that rocked the world? Anybody know what statement he made? That he was going to retire. Now, how can God retire? But he retired. He steps down. Look what it says. Had it ever happened before? Had a, had a pope ever retired? Yes or no? Yes. He was resigning on February, he said, becoming the first pope to do so in what? So it happened 600 years ago. Now, interesting, when you go back 600 years, historically, you'll find out something was happening that has a direct connection to now, but that's not our study. Who is this? Antichrist. Go in your Bible to 2 Thessalonians. What book did I say? Go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now, write this down. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Let's turn there. Chapter 2. And let's begin in, now you told me you wanted the red pill. Is that what you told me? All right. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, we're studying the Bible. The Bible is explaining itself. Let's pick up now in verse uh, 1. What does it say in verse 1? Now we beseech you, brethren, Second Thessalonians 2, 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind, nor be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us. In other words, don't accept the counterfeit. As that the day of Christ is what? He said, don't let anybody fool you about the second coming of Jesus Christ. Make sure that what you believe is based on the truth and not a counterfeit. Then in verse 3, what did he say in verse 3? It says, let how many men? Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day coming of Christ shall not come except there come a what? Fall away first. That was the great apostasy that brought the dark ages and the little horn. It says, in the falling of away first and the man of... Who is that man of sin? It says, there would be a man of what? Talk to me. Who is this man of sin? How do we know it? Because remember, right plan, right, right man. Wrong man, wrong. wrong man. See, the plan of redemption shows us the right plan. And if we don't understand that, we'll start following and worshiping the man of sin, the Pope of Rome. Well, who is this man? Who is the wrong man? Let's look. It says the man of sin, he must be revealed, the son of perdition. Verse 4. Who is this man? Who opposeth, and what else? Exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. So if a man claims to be God, what is that man doing? Well, that's blasphemy. He's trying to take the place of God. So this man of sin is a man who does what? Who claims to be who? Now, there's only one man on this earth who claims to be this man right here. What man is this? Talk to me. That's the Pope of Rome. You're not afraid to say it, are you? It says... Falling away first in the medicine reveal, verse 4, who opposed of it exalted himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is what? But then this God retired and so called, so called and another, not another one comes on the scene. And did you see him the other day? That woman tried to grab hold of him and you saw what he did? It almost took his arm off. His whole body shook and his face got distorted and he pow! I mean, it was like, what in the world? I mean, he gave it to her. I don't know if you saw it. And it's like the, the television is like, like that. They just replayed it again. And again, they showed his face going. <laughs> and then he got on the news, and guess what he said? I'm sorry. That's a sin. So God sins? Now, people sit there to believe this. I'm not trying to make fun. I'm telling us. 
This is not Christ. This is Antichrist. Now, in fact, he tries to look like, just like God. Now, I'm not going to go through all the text, but there's more text to show you that. See this man right here? Who is this? That's him. Oh, Francis, let me, now, let me blow it up. Let me see if I can blow it up. You see who this right here? Do you know who has two golden cherubims beside his throne? If you were to go back to Isaiah 37 and go back to Exodus 25, you will see that God himself sits between two golden cherubims. He is trying to show himself God. There's no person in any other religion on this earth that has this. That's the man of sin. Now, just so you think I made it up, I, I, I let the horse talk. So this is CTV. This is Catholic television. So you know what it is. In April 14, 2013, Pope Francis celebrated Mass for the first time outside in the Basilica. Uh, it's, it, it brought it out here. Now, watch now. Pope enthroned between two cherubims, showing himself that he is God. I ask you, who but the Antichrist would dare enthrone himself between two golden cherubims as if he were seated on the mercy seat of the ark in the place of the glory of God, showing himself that he is what? God. That's blasphemy. And then you remember, he started the pagan ass Wednesday where you throw up the ashes. And then for 40 days, and this is where all that 40 days stuff came from. They came into the Seventh Adventist Church. It came from ash. They did it for 40 days, weeping for Tammuz. You were reading Ezekiel 8. And so when they did it, the Pope, he started doing what? Blowing his nose. He started coughing. They said, I wonder if he has coronavirus. You know, all of Italy shut down. Over 16 million in the entire country shut down. But then they tested him and said, oh, no, he doesn't have it. But it's okay. It's okay. Now, look. Anybody know what this is right here? Is the deadly wound healed? Yes or no? Go to Revelation 13. No, the deadly wound is not healed. Go to Revelation 13. Go to Revelation 13. Go to Revelation 13, verse 3. The Bible says that now the Pope is at the head of this beast power that received the deadly wound. Look at Revelation 13. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. Verse 3, speaking of this beast power, speaking of the Pope of the Catholic Church with the Pope of Rome at his head. What does it say in verse 3? It says, and I saw what? One of his heads as it was wounded to death. What year did his head get wounded? What year? 1798. That was after 1793? After the French Revolution, at the end of the French Revolution, history, history tells us that, brothers and sisters, the Pope was dethroned. This is when they received the deadly wound. What was the deadly wound? It was a separation of church and state. So what would heal the deadly wound? A reinstitution of what? Church and state. What government would have to give its state power back to Rome in order to heal church and state? What government? America. And so my brothers and sisters, America would have to form an image of the beast and have a church and state united in America, which would mean we would have to get rid of our constitution. Now, this says, what about 1929? Anybody know what happened in 1929? There was a lot of entreaty sign. And in the New York Times, what did it say? Mortal wound heal. Now, Revelation 13 says, I saw one of his heads as he was wounded to death, wounded to death, and his deadly, what? Wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. So my brothers and sisters, the world thought that the wound was healed in 1929. Was it healed, yes or no? No, it was not. Now, you're going to find out that the healing process did start. But let's see why it was not healed. Great Controversy 266. Let's read this. What does it say? It says, the periods here mentioned, 42 months and 1,203 score days. What is that? 1,200 and what? 60 years. Are the same, alike representing the time in which the Church of Christ was to suffer oppression from Rome. The 1260 years of papal supremacy began in what? AD what? 538, and would therefore, therefore terminate when? And that time, a French army entered Rome and made the Pope a what? Prisoner, and he died in exile, though a new Pope was soon afterward what? The papal hierarchy has never, has what? Never since been able to wield the what? So that means that in order for a daily wound to be healed, she must once again have that power that she had before 1798. So we need to find out from Bible what is that power that she had. Because then the, the wound will be healed. Let's see. Revelation 13. Look at verse 2. When you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. Let's read verse 2. What does it say? And the beast, which I saw was likened to a leopard. Same beast from Daniel 7. And his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a dragon, and the dragon gave him his, his, and that's what's interesting, we're trying to find out what this power is, because that's going to let us know when the deadly wound is healed. It said the dragon gave him his power, his seat, and what else? Great authority. So we want to see what type of power is this, verse 5. Let's go to verse 5. What does verse 5 say? And there was given unto him, what? A mouth speaking great things, and what else? blasphemies and there's that word again and what power was given unto him to continue how long 40 and two months that's that same 42 months everything the prophet says the bible says 40 and two months 
So this power that she had, she would only operate it for 42 months, which is the same as 1260 days. And in Bible prophecy, a day is a year. So it's 1260 years from 538 to 1798. So this is what the Bible is talking about. Then the Bible says it will receive a daily wound. It will lose that power. Well, what power was it? Look at what it says in verse 7. Revelation 13, verse 7. Let's read verse 7. What does it say? And it was given unto him to make what? War with the saints and to overcome them. And what's the next word? Power was given him to, to do what? Talk to me. It says power was given him where? Not under, but what? Over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Question. Here was a power... This was a power that the man of sin under the Catholic Church had, and this power, how much of the world did it uh, 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 control? How much? Power over all nations. So this was world power. Now, if I was talking about under, what would I call it? Sub, subway, under. If I was talking about over, what would I call it? Super. So then it would have to be the world, what? It will be the superpower of the world. That's the power she had before. Now, what type of power? It was over all nations. Now, when you rule a nation, what type of power does that? Civil power or religious power? So civil power is the power that she had over all nations to control it, to prosecute, to persecute, to drag in, uh, dragonian persecution. Now, notice what the Bible says, and what the Bible says in Revelation 13. Not only did she have that power, though, verse 8. Let's read verse 8 together. What does the Bible say in verse 8? And all that dwell upon the earth shall what? Worship him whose names are not written. Now, so now, listen. If I deal with a power that is being worshipped, what am I dealing with? A civil power or religious power that is being worshipped? So this beast power had not only civil power of the world, but it also had what? Religious. Now, when you combine religious power and civil power, you have a union of what? Church and state, which was the power that the beast had. So in 1798, it can only be two powers that were lost. It was either the civil power or the religious power. Question, in 1798, did she lose religious power of worship? Yes or no? No, she did not. She remained the church. Though a new pope was soon afterward elected, the papyrarchy has never since been able to wield what? So she continued to retain religious power, but what she lost was what? So the deadly wound was the loss of world civil power. Then what would heal the deadly wound? The restoration of what? World civil power. Who is the superpower of the world today? So then who would have to give its power to the papacy in order for there to be a, 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 a wound healed? So then America and the papacy would have to join in order for there to be a uh, restoration and the healing of the deadly wound. Does it make sense, yes or no? Is that Bible, yes or no? Everything the prophet says, the Bible says. Now let's go a little further. Now we see that. This is the Catholic encyclopedia, so you'll see that the Bible says it, the Spirit of Prophecy says it, and the Catholic Church tell you. It says, the temporal sovereignty of the what? Pope. End it. Now, temporal, that's civil. Uh, Pope ended during the French what? Revolution when the French army captured Rome in what? 1798. But he, because of this, the French had him dethroned. He was exiled and imprisoned him. This is from the internet of what? Catholic encyclopedia. So it's there. It's the same thing. Here are the picture of it. After that, something happened. Let me show you what happened. Here's the deadly wound, 1798. What happened in 1798? To get a deadly wound, she lost what? power over the world. But guess what? The wound got worse after 1798. It didn't get better immediately. It went worse. A second thing happened. Something happened in 1870. What happened in 1870? Anybody know what happened in 1870? In 1870, she lost power over what? Now guess what? Even though she lost power over the world in 1798, she still retained power over Italy, over the Vatican states there in Rome. But in 1870, she went now even further and lost power over the little Vatican states in, in there in Italy. Are you following me? Now, do you know that at that time, there was a little woman with a third grade education with the spirit of God saying that this power is going to regain control over the entire world. And every person in the world thought she was crazy. How could she, how could this happen? This was the testimony of Jesus. Let's test. What does it take then to heal the wound? It took two steps to create the deadly wound. Then it would take two steps to what? What, would the, what two steps would have to happen? First, you would have to regain what? Power over what? Italy. Is, that the, is the wound healed now? No. Then she had to regain power over the what? World. World. Are you following me? Yes. All right. Here's a, a famous historian named David Kurtzer. 
He was a university of, uh, professor of anthropology, study of man, professor of history. He was a professor of many different things of, at Brown's University, a well-known university. He's not a Seventh-day Adventist. He's not a Christian, but he's a historian. He wrote this book called Prisoner of the Vatican. In this book, Prisoner of the Vatican, he tells us something. You can get this on the, uh, uh, Wikipedia, too, but it's the same thing. It says, a prisoner in the Vatican or a prisoner of the Vatican. That's how Pope Pius described himself after the capture of Rome by armed forces of the Kingdom of Italy on 1870, September 20. They were captured, and then Italy, it lost. It says here, the city's capture ended the millennial temporal rule of the popes over central Italy. Someone says, well, I thought they lost that in 1798, the temporal power, but they lost it over the world. But they retained it over Italy. But in 1870, on September 20, they lost it over Italy, and now they have nothing. They're at the bottom. But the Bible says, I saw a deadly wound, but his deadly wound would be... And all of the world would run after the beast. They would have world power again. Now, my brothers and sisters, guess what? From 1870s to 1929, how long is that? 59 years. For the next 59 years, 1870 to 1929, the popes refused to leave the Vatican. We learned about this in class this week. To avoid any appearance of accepting the authority wielded by the Italian government. Because the Italy took away, the, 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 they used to put a blessing over, uh, uh, over Italy. The Pope would put it on, but he said, you know what, I'm mad, just like a little boy. I'm mad, I'm not going to bless them. I'm going to keep my blessing to myself. And so he wouldn't even open the gate. He called himself a prisoner in the Vatican. But guess what? After 59 years, something happened. Something happened, deadly wound. In 1798, she lost power over the world. 1870, she lost power over But something happened. What does it take to heal the wound? You remember that? 1929, she didn't gain control over the world. She regained control over what? Italy. Was that the healing of the deadly wound? No. That was only its what? Italy. Beginning. Anybody know when it happened? 1929. Let's see it. Deadly wound. Here's the men. Vatican, heal wound of many years. Deadly wound. Healing begins. Let's see when. The Lateran Treaty was one of the Lateran Pacts of 1929. Agreements made 1921 9 between the Kingdom of Italy and the Holy See, as they call it. Signed when? Talk to me. When was it signed? Now remember, dates are important. Is that right? That's what happened here in the French Revolution. Same date. Now, so it says it was signed when? February 11, what? 1929. February 11, 1929, the healing begins. Look what that says. It says, a lightning strikes St. Peter's Dome. They might remember what happened. Do you know that when, when the Pope said he would step down, Pope Benedict, 1600 years before, 600 years, when he said he would step down, three lightning bolts hit the top of Vatican. The first was missed. The second two was caught by recording. This was two. Now, interesting enough, guess what day it was when that happened? A lightning strikes St. Peter's Dome at, on the Vatican when? When did it happen? Talk to me. I can't hear you. February what? Do these things, you think these things happen accidentally, yes or no? Now what happened February 11, 1929? The healing was what? Beginning. So what do you think is happening years later in February 11, 2013? What do you think is happening? Talk to me. This next Pope who comes in is going to assist the process, not of keeping the wound there. He's going to assist the process of what? Healing, healing the wound. February 11, 2013. Down to the exact what? Is that true? All right. The healing is moving into its ending stage. It's not over yet. And this pope, when he came on the scene, did he start doing something? Yes or no? The New World Pope, he was the one they said they can bring all the world over. In five minutes, he won the world. They said, Pope Francis, the man who won over the world in what? This Pope is different. They've never seen this. We have never seen a Pope become so popular in just a couple of minutes. This is a French historian and expert on religion. They said, we've never seen this before. Why now? Because it's time for the healing of the deadly what? It has to happen on time. Watch now. All of a sudden, we have the first what? Jesuit Pope. When has this happened before? Never. Inspiration says, now time is almost finished, and what we've been years learning, they will have to learn in their what? We're in that time right now. Watch now. The handwriting is on the wall. Now, question. It says, Pope Francis to become first pope to address what? Question. Did he come on the scene doing just what he was supposed to do? In order for the popes to help and, and for his daily wound to be healed, that meant that he would have to have control again over America's world power. Where did he go? 
He went to Congress. What pope had ever been to Congress? What pope? Now, don't be distracted. Now, don't be distracted. We, we, we want to follow this. Don't be distracted. Heavenly Father, please, this is so serious. Help us to see this because you're trying to give every one of us a warning right now so that we can be ready. Lord, we want to be ready. Please, Lord, help us to hear you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, watch. Pope Francis has become the first pope to address Congress. Question. Has any other pope ever came to Congress? Someone said, well, popes have been coming to America all the time. Come to the United Nations. But, but there is no pope ever that's ever come to Congress except for this one. And why did he do it now? It's getting ready for the healing of the what? Oh, let's watch this now. He addresses Congress. It says, those who reject the light of truth will yet seek the, of this what? Self-styled, infallible power to exalt an institution that originated with what? So the Protestant world is going to seek the pope. And guess what? How readily she will what? So the pope is going to help America. To the help of what? Protestants in this work, it is not difficult to conjecture. The Pope knows what's happening. He's just waiting his time. Pope Francis, sick with an apparent cold, counsels audiences in, amid Italy's coronavirus fears. Here's him blowing his nose right there. Pope Francis canceled part of his schedule. Daily wound. When did it start healing? Talk to me. Well, no, no, give me dates. Remember? Dates are important. February 11th? 1929. What about this strike? When? February what? 2013. All right, let's watch it. 84 years later. Now, coronavirus on what? Give me a date. Man, my hair stands up, my brothers and sisters. I can't make this up. On February 11, 2020, the World Health Organization announced an official name for the disease or pestilence that is causing the current outbreak called COVID-19. So then, what happened February 11 back here? It started it. What's happening right here? A new pope comes in to help it to come to an end, and then what comes on the scene right on time? Now, my brothers and sisters, what is America getting ready to do? Speak as a? Yes. Question. Has this begin? Is this the beginning of the end? Yes or no? Yes. You think this is accidental? Yes or no? My brothers and sisters, there's a relationship between these dates. The exact same dates. There's a relationship. History repeats itself. I say again, 2020 is no ordinary. ordinary year. My brothers and sisters, it happened right on time. Hitherto for those who presented the truths of the third angel's message have often been regarded as mere what? Their predictions that religious intolerance will gain control of the United States, that church and state would unite to do what? Persecute those who keep the commandments of God have been, pronounced, has been pronounced groundless and what? It has been declared. What has it been declared? Talk to me. That this land could never become other than what has been the defender of religious freedom. Someone says, what about the Statue of Liberty? Yes, but the Statue of Liberty is not what you think it is. You know where it came from? France. You better understand what its real name is, but I can't tell you. Now, let me continue. It says, it has been confidently declared this land could never become other than what has been the defender of religious freedom. But as the question of enforcing what? Sunday observance is widely agitated. The event so long doubted and disbelieved is what? Seen. seen to be what? It's seen to be approaching, and the third message, the one that warns against the beast's image is marked, will produce an effect which it could not have had. My brothers and sisters, and then all of a sudden it says, go to Revelation 13. Do we have, do we have, do we have the papers? The papers? Revelation 13. Revelation 13, beginning in verse... Uh, Revelation 13, beginning in verse 11. The Bible speaking of this power says, And I beheld another beast. Who is this? Talk to me. Who is this? This is the United States of America. Revelation 13, 11. This time I'm talking about America. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. Verse 12. And he exercised how much? That means he gets again the civil power, and the deadly wound would be what? He exercised all the power of the first beast before him and cause of the earth, and then which dwelled therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was? Once he exercised that power again, his deadly wound is healed. 
What does he do before he can speak as a dragon? Because Revelation 13, 11 says he speaks as a dragon. Verse 15 says, and he had power, America had power, to give life to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both what? Speak and cause that as many as not, would not worship the image of the beast should be? So my brothers and sisters, this tells me that when America speaks as a dragon, it's going to start persecution. That's the nature of a dragon. It's a persecuting power. Am I right or wrong? So then what would have to happen before America passes a Sunday law? She would have to then, her form of government must change where she would move from a liberty, free loving power. She would have to become a dragonian power for a Sunday law to be passed, for the deadly wound to be heal and what if the virus that came at the same date of the healing is the thing that helps her to move from a lamb to a dragon would it make sense yes or no yes. now watch this says the government imposed a mass quarantine on an american city could or should they you think they should yes or no china waited weeks before reporting a novel coronavirus to the world health organization the virus now designated name, species from an animal to human in Wuhan, seafood market in early December, initiating the outbreak. You know, it's a wonderful thing when the guy gave us a health message. What do you say? You don't have to be afraid running around. I'm not going to shake that person's hand. I don't know if I shake that person's hand. Do you know that God gave us the ministry of healing? Was Jesus afraid to touch the leper? He had the ministry of healing. Why should we be afraid? How can we as medical missionaries, do you know the process of medical missionaries, you have to come in contact with somebody that has a, a problem. The, the, the medical missionary work, you've got to come in close contact and mingle. That's Christ's method. But you're not afraid if you understand God's plan. Now my brother and sister, it says, a thousand shall fall by my side and ten thousands by my right side. The pestilence says, but it shall not come nigh me if we have a CIP. <laughs> it won't come nigh me. Now, let's continue. But after a costly delay, China locked down Wuhan, Wuhan and wider Hubei province. And it says the largest shutdown, a guarded area where no one can leave or enter in what? It's, what's the next word? Dragonian measure. So when they start quarantining, what nature were they demonstrating? Dragon. The dragon. Italy considers even what? More what? Dragonian, Wuhan style coronavirus quarantine. So when we start beginning uh, quarantining, what nature are we putting forth? What nature is the government putting forth? A dragon line. All right. So what if America then were to start doing this? What would America be beginning to do? So what will be the next step? Deadly wound healed, Sunday law passed. Too late for Seventh-day Adventists to get ready. And nobody is saying nothing. You will go to church and just sing and dance and sing and dance. But when this passes, nobody will be singing and dancing. You will say, Lord, it's not my brother nor my sister. It's me. Efforts to control the coronavirus in the U.S. could get even more what if the National Guards were to be sent into America? Who, pray, who, and that's not saying who, World Health Organization, praises China's what? Drag. Why are they using these words? If you understand the puzzle, you can put it together. Even a child can see it now. National Guard activated in six states to help fight coronavirus. What has America begun doing? What date is this? 13th. That's yesterday. What is America beginning to do right now? Speak as a dragon. We have but a little time left, brother. Now, when she speaks as a dragon, guess what? What's the next thing happen? Trump then, same day, 13th, yesterday, Trump then declares not just an emergency, but a what? What does that sound like? Donald Trump declares what? Sunday. Man. Do you see it step by step as it comes time? We can see it approaching. What should we be doing? We should be getting our homes in order. Our hearts in order. We should be following all the instruction God has given us. Now my time is almost gone. I believe, brothers and sisters, that when that happens, the Bible says in verse 17, and that no man might what? Buy or sell. Now question. What's going to happen to the entire American economy when that goes down? Collapse. 
what will you do? What will you do? Do you know that before that time, God wanted that somebody, let's close in Hebrews 11. Let's go to Hebrews 11. Let's go to Hebrews 11. What book did I say? Do you know what God said? Is the son-in-law almost here, yes or no? Yes. God has shown us this. Look what this says. Let's read that together. What does it say? What type of economy can go through this final global crisis when no man can buy or sell? Has there ever been an economy in the universe that is operated without buying and selling? You know what it's called? The kingdom of what? Of heaven. How much money does God pay Gabriel to fly, fly to this earth? They say, if you fly faster, I'll give you a raise. <laughs> Gabriel's not doing that. <laughs> He's operating on a no-buy, no-sale economic system. And the Bible says, in this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the income. Now, my brothers and sisters, the Bible tells us about that. Then Jesus said, thy kingdom, he taught us to pray this way, uh, the Lord's Prayer, that he have us to pray, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy, thy kingdom. kingdom come. That same one that's in heaven, thy kingdom come, thy will be done where? On earth, on earth as it is in heaven. Question. So if they're on a no buy, no sell system of government in heaven, and thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven, then on earth, what must the gospel of the kingdom produce? A no buy, no sell system where? on earth. Was there ever a place on the earth where this no-buy-sell system was not only talked about, but where this no-buy-no-sell system was actually set up? Do you know where it was? In the Garden of Eden. So then, what is the only type of economy that can go through this? Something that has been, we have entitled the Eden economy. Our next move is to bring into existence for our people that all who want, just like an ark, an Eden economy that can take us out of the Babylonian system. Babylon is fallen. It's political system. It's economic system. It's social system. It's educational system. It's whole system of living. It's collapsing. And God says, come out of her and come into a new system. Do you know right now, do you know that the way that our economy is running at Seven Adventists is a poor economy? But it doesn't have to be. You remember I told you, and I want to constantly make this up in your mind. I'll repeat it as much as I can until it gets into all of our heads because there's something that we need to do. Now, my brothers and sisters, what I want to ask you is, do you know how much tithe should have come into the Seventh Amendment Church in 2012? Two billion dollars. Well, that's, that's what came in. Where two billion dollars came in. I have an article. I can't show you now because time is getting away from me. But I have an article that says, from our official papers, no offshoot, God has a body, a church, a church. And from the church, it says that the tithing was down by 10 billion. This is way back in 2012. If we, have more, we should be getting more money today. But this is back in 2012. I use that figure. Now, what then should have been at least the gross figure that the tithe of the seven church should have brought in? 12 billion. More so today, it's over uh, 14 billion. But let, let's do that. Now, if, if, if the tithing of the church is 12 to 14 billion dollars, question. What is 10% of 12 to 14 billion dollars? What is 10%? No, let me say it better. Let me say it better. If tithing is 12 billion and the tithing is 10%, how much money has actually gone through the hand of the seven Adventist denomination? Someone said, I don't know. I said, You don't pay tithe? And someone said, Well, I don't get that much money. You know? <laughs> But that means at least $120 billion is coming through the hands of Seven Net Venice. If you study economy, you will find that there's something called the GDP, which is the gross domestic product. You will find that there are not 70% of the world nations that handle that type of money. I'm not talking about denominations, I'm talking about nations. That, that the Seventh Adventist Church is, is operating more money than nearly 70% of the world's nations. But guess what? What do we have? Nothing. Where are our factories? Where are our buildings? Where are our banks? Where are our infrastructure? Where are those things that can build and the industry that can provide for all of us? You know, these nations have things to build their roads. They have facilities. They have infrastructure. They have food factories. They have banks. They have all these various things. But we have that. Now, why is it that we don't have that? It's because we have been fooled into a slave mindset. 
Now, if you study economy, you'll find that there are groups of people that learn how to use their economy. If you, there are several classes of people. Uh, do you know that, that, that the economists have studied classes, and they found that any time that a class learns how to use their money together, they become wealthy. So let me tell you some classes of people. You'll know some. You know that one of the wealthiest classes is called the Jewish community. Now, their economy, they bounce their money at least 12 times. At least what? 12 times. Give me your average number to simplify it. What do I mean by bounce? Because anybody who learns to do that, it becomes wealthy. By bouncing the money, what it means is that when you get a paycheck, you use it in the same community you belong in. So in other words, you get a paycheck and you need to buy food, you go to a what type of community? Jewish community. If you need to buy a clothes, they go to guess what community? A Jewish community. They need to get a mechanic, they guess, guess who they go to? Another Jew. And they do that at least 12 times. Now by doing that, you will find out that the money begins to multiply inside of that people. The Chinese community do the same thing. The Mexican community does the same thing. I don't know about anybody, but maybe that's true too. Uh, but, but there are several classes that do this. I saw a major study from economists that are explaining these classes and from study. But guess what? Now you come to the Seventh-day Adventists. How many times does his money bounce? Not even once. The moment he gets a paycheck, you go run to Babylon. You go run to the world, and guess what? You are making her, and it's, it's just a little mathematics. It doesn't take long, much. That if you take a $120 billion, sister, out of the hands of seven and a half minutes and pour it into the hands of the world, then seven and a half minutes are getting poor while the world is getting richer. We're paying them to persecute us. And so Babylon has churches debt-free. Babylon has school debt-free. Babylon has hotels debt-free. Babylon has banks. Babylon has all of this. And you and I as seven of us are left with nothing because you're nothing but a slave. I know you don't like me telling you this, but you told me you wanted the red pill. Why is it that a seven of us couldn't get his clothes from another seven of us and his food from another seven of us? Why did you have to go down to Costco? Why is it that if, if there's barbers, why would a seven of go out to a worldly barber when every seven of could go to a seven of barber and no seven of barber would ever have any wonderful money? Do you know that in this room right here, if we were to put this eating economy into effect, in this room right here, we would have enough beyond measure to take care of every one of us if we knew how to put it in place. But we have people that are claimed to be intelligent, claimed to have PhDs, claim to spend all their time with the education of this world. And do you know, as Seven Adventists, we are smart people, intelligent. Do you know that we have people in every field of knowledge? You go to the banker, you have a Seven Adventist at the top. You go to the uh, law enforcement center, you have a Seven Adventist at the head of chief staff of police. You go to the university, Seven Adventists at the head. You go to the hospital system, Seven Adventists at the head. But he is trained as a slave to do it for someone else, but he won't do it for himself. What else could you be called? What else can I be called when I won't work for myself and God, when I will only work for someone else? You're nothing but a what? Slave. And God wants to take us out of the slavery of Egypt and Babylon into the promised land where my brothers and sisters, we can live without buying and selling. And by God's grace, we're going to put into effect and we're willing to do it with anybody or with nobody. Amen. Are you with me? Amen. Do you want to learn how to get into position? Yes. Well, if you want to, we have this. We have a little handout. I wish if I can get some hands to help me. Now, please, when you get one of these papers, please don't read it right now. You can read it when you get home. I want you to have it now, and I want to say this, and I must close. We have to work to get together among ourselves. And the next, would you pass it? I'll just break it up. Let me get a couple of myself, too. Uh, and give them a little more. What we have to do, please, don't look at it. Just put it down. You can look at it later. This Eden Economy Challenge, brothers and sisters, we need to learn how to organize and go into practical training because you're going to find that it's going to take three steps to get to a no buy, no sell system. How many steps? The plan that we're introducing now that's going to be done here at Apocalypse uh, Ministries and it's going to be done at our ministry and anyone else who wants to join in, please, you're going to find the website. You're going to find the information. But I encourage you, please, take the challenge. Take the what? Challenge. Now, let me tell you what the challenge is in short. The challenge tells you that this time of no buying, no selling is coming. It's going to be very serious.
Please don't read it, my brother. My brother, if, if you just work along with me, you get a chance to read as much as you want. But I just want you to hear me now so you don't miss this, and then we'll get ready to close on this part. Thank you. Just put it to the side, fold it up, put it aside. You can read it later in detail. But my brothers and sisters, the only thing that is keeping this back is selfishness and a lack of faithfulness. We want to learn how to get into position. Amen? Now, we're going to find out that there's three phases. This is the first. There's a second phase and a third phase. And in the third phase, in the most holy place, we'll be able to operate with no buying and selling. But if we can't do phase one, we don't need to talk about phase what? Two or three. Do you want to get into phase one? Yes or no? The challenge is going to, for two months. How long? Two months. That's not a long time, is it? Well, how long is the quarantine? It may be for a month or two. For two months, you are to document where you spend your money. We have sheets, free sheets on the website you can download that make it very simple to keep a track of and account of. And find out how long or how many, how many places can you buy it from Seven Day Adventist. I wonder how many you will find for two months. Now, if you can't find a Seven Adventist product or service, then you can go wherever the Lord leads you. But document it. Write it down. Document it. And it means something. I want you to do this because you're going to find out if you do this challenge, it's one of the best things you can do because you might find out that, wait a minute, here's a product and a service that is not here among Seven Adventists, but I have that skill. What can you bring into existence? A business, a family ministry business. We'll then take that demand and the law and we can put the person with the skill. And we can begin working with each other and everything we need. You know, in this room, I would have caught out how many can build, his hands will go up. How many can do electrical work, hands will go up. How many can do plumbing, hands will go up. How many can garden, hands will go up. How many can do this, hands will go up. And you know that everything we need to sustain life, we have in this room right here. God and each other, that's all we need. That's how it was in the early rain when they had God and each other in the early rain. They took the gospel to all the world in one generation and the Bible says they lacked nothing. But they were poor when they started off. But when they got into this economy, they lacked nothing. And just before the loud cry in the latter rain, God is going to have a people that will go back into this economy. I want to do it. What do you say? Amen. And again, I say we'll do it with everybody or we'll do it with nobody. nobody. Do you think it's time? Yes or no? Amen. It's past time. And our next move is to help all of our people that want it to bring into existence. Do you know it's very simple to be able to move into this process? The gospel is a wonderful simplifier. And so we want to begin as the days go up at camp meeting. We're going to be talking about this. If God allows camp meeting, you know that the devil don't like this. When they have meetings sometimes 250 or more, they're trying to shut these things down. Am I right? Yeah. But if God allows for camp meeting, we're going to start putting this together. All of our families, all of our ministries who want to. And by the grace of God, we're going to move forward. I say I want to do this. What do you say? Yeah. But the greatest thing that we need in all of this is not only that physical preparation, you know what the greatest preparation is? With that physical must come a what? Spiritual. Let's close in verse 7. Hebrews 11, verse 7. Let's read it together. What does the Bible say? By faith, Noah being warned after he saw the quarantine. That what your Bible say? I'm making sure you have the right version. It says, by faith Noah being warned of God of things what? Not seen as yet. Now we already see this, but there's some more stuff we haven't seen yet. Don't wait until the Sunday law. We got to move now. They moved. They didn't sit down. They did what? Move with fear. And prepared a what? Ark to the saving of his. The family was saved. By the which he condemned the world and became the heir of, talk to me, righteousness by faith. The type of righteousness by faith I want is the type that Noah had. Not only did he talk about it, but he built it. If he had a Bible in one hand, he had a hammer in the other. And they believed what he preached. I say, my brothers and sisters, it's time to put this ark together. And God is making it very, very simple. And so if you're interested in that, please take one of these papers, do the challenge. And right now, as we get ready to close, were you blessed? Amen. Did you learn something? Yes. Do you think we need to move into this eating economy? But most importantly, we need Jesus. The Bible says, greater love have no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friend. So when America speaks of the dragon, she's going to stop buying and selling. But the last thing she's going to do is she's going to cause both 
when she speaks to be persecuted and killed. But if we are the friend of Jesus, we'll go through it. What do you say? Amen. I want to be his friend, don't you? Amen. But to become his friend, it takes time. And time is running out. Let us pray. I repeat again, dear Lord, 2020 is no ordinary year. That this pandemic is a sign that you gave us, a pestilence, that shows us that this generation should not pass. This is the beginning of the end. And you showed us, Lord, that this is even connected directly with the healing of the wound and America speaking as a dragon. And Lord, if this world is collapsing, the universities are collapsing, we can see right now Many are putting their trust in schools and universities, but when a crisis like this comes, it all shuts down. And then you're kicked out. Harvard kicked out everybody. But the Eden economy will kick out nobody. It would allow us to come into an ark where we can be saved with Jesus and help many others. Help us to take this serious. Help us to read the papers, to take the challenge, and then to learn how to get involved so that we can become your friend and set our hearts and home in order. Help us to give you time from this day forward. Lord, let may this be the beginning of radical changes in our lives through Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, that no matter how many mistakes we've made, you don't condemn us. You tell us to come to you so that you can redeem us and save us and then use us to help others. Thank you, Lord, for this entire school. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.